Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this afternoon's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Maya, your host, and we're excited to be presenting the KW Writers Alliance Oral Storytelling, a discussion of how oral storytelling is relevant today in partnership with the KW Writers Alliance. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Toronto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honours these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. So just a few announcements before we introduce today's panellists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32-year history, and that's not strictly true because this year's celebration also includes four days of in-person author signings at local bookstores. We'll be at another Story Bookshop today, with more coming later this week. Check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see the signing schedule for all the shops. Don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. This is the fourth day of our festival, celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Earlier today, we streamed Diaspora Dialogues in conversation with Anna Sharani and John Krizank, a discussion of their new dramas, which is available for replay on our YouTube channel, The Word on the Street Toronto. Following this panel, we will be joined by uh, more folks from the KW Writers Alliance for Writers on Reading. And for more information on uh, all of our upcoming panels, you can visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoyed today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. So now I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Tenille Warren. Tenille is a Jamaican-born, non-binary, and queer immigrant artist living on Turtle Island. They hold an MFA in creative writing from the University of Guelph. Tenille is a 2013 Obsidian Theatres Playwrights Unit Fellow, uh, and a 2017-2018 Buddies in Bad Times artist in residence. Their work has been staged at the Rhubarb and Rock Paper Sisters Festival and Summerworks. They are the co-founder of Inside Waterloo, an independent media outline, a member of the Textile Magazine editorial team, and have been published in various outlets. They are the Equity and Inclusion Officer at the WRDSB and co-founder of the digital publication Inside Waterloo. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tanil. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Maya. How are you doing? Not too bad at all. Thanks for asking. Uh, and I'll leave it to you to introduce our panelists. Perfect. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I would like to welcome our panelists by first bringing to bring in Bashar Lulu Jabur. Uh, Bashar is an immigrant poet. He uses simple details to give a glimpse of the complexities of leaving one home for another. Bashar is a storyteller, and his stories have been featured at Canadian Festival of Spoken Word, Naked Art, Heart, and as opening act for Carlos Andres Gomez. Welcome, Bashar. Uh, next, we have Carolee Waking. Carolee is a professional storyteller and writer with a wide repertoire with which she has traveled widely within Canada and abroad. She has taught workshops from the Yukon to Australia for all ages and has directed concerts, series, and festivals in Ontario. She is artistic director of Fresh Stories in Cambridge. Welcome, Carolee. Thank you. Embers remember the spark even in the dark. Though Sarah Gransko grew up in hearing only swear words in Norwegian, she now shares the complex traditional music and oral traditions of our heritage as if reigniting a sense of genetic memory. With the other foot firmly planted in contemporary Canada, Sarah bridges worlds. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, oral storytelling is personally very important to me. My uh, cultural background, and I'm really ready to delve into the different perspectives that um, we have to offer. 
So my first question um, kind of puts it back on word on the street when I was looking at the event details and it was described as an ancient uh, tradition from thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, and I'm always gonna bring it back to education. So how do you think this label of ancient uh, impacts how storytelling is positioned in the literary and performing arts? And I think I will start with Carol Lee. Well, I agree. It is probably the first and most ancient of all the arts. One of the things that early people probably had to do was convey a lot of information, like how not to be eaten by that which you wish to eat. And um, all the, the lore and, and wisdom that was gathered was conveyed orally because there wasn't any other way. I have seen ancient cave paintings and they tell a lot too. That's another way of storytelling, but they don't have the details. I think oral storytelling was the only way for millennia for human beings to convey the information that they needed to convey a lot of that that was information became folktale. And folktales have been passed down through the millennia and through the generations. And there are many things that have happened in my lifetime that were actually predicted in story that was told as story, but were in, in fact, information and a lot, a lot of that have happened in the past that have only storytelling to um, keep that history alive. There's a story I tell about uh, a tsunami. It's a Japanese folk tale, but the people in Asia who knew this story didn't die in that tsunami of 2005 or whatever it was. And the people who didn't know the story suffered more. It's, it's powerful. It's, it's a powerful way of, of keeping our wisdom. I think all the wisdom in the world exists in stories. It's, Oral literacy is a precursor to reading literacy and the interaction that happens in storytelling as opposed to reading or um, other ways of conveying things, it's an inter interpersonal conveying of whatever it is. Sometimes storytelling is just entertainment. A lot of times it is. But a lot of times it is something that is important for us to remember. And there's a lot of research that shows that the only learning happens in relationship. So storytelling is a relationship, mm -hmm. which I'm sure that Bashar and Sarah both know. Absolutely. That's enough for me. Um, does anyone have anything to to add? I think she's basically said it all. Um, in terms of it being ancient, it brings us beyond ourselves, which I think is really important. And it requires people to carry it on. And also the fact that it's ancient means that it evolves because time goes on and traditions have always evolved. And that's a very important factor as well. Yes. So. Um, I think uh, the one thing that I was thinking about when I read this question is um, is also the limitation it offers uh, because we think of we think of storytelling as specifically the act of oral storytelling, the or specifically sitting down telling a story to a group of people. But I I, I was reflecting on this ad I saw by Louis Vuitton uh, with Yasin Bey, who's a poet and a rapper, who was reciting a poem that Muhammad Ali had written and performed at a press conference and um and it's all it's kind of so ingrained into the modern world like oral storytelling because Muhammad Ali was joining on so many traditions of storytelling himself um 
and now it's made it into a mass media campaign. But we think of even like podcasts um, and audiobooks and um, how much these require oral, oral storytelling skills and know-how. Yeah. And they're an essential part of our kind of media consumption today. Um, and so the, the kind of the ancient, I think, sometimes limits it to has to be a certain way. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it evolves. So I totally agree that that's also oral storytelling. Absolutely. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things about it is the word tradition, because if I'm to put it all together, it, essentially you're, you're describing life. It's information that we use to survive. Those same stories and anecdotes exist. Um, that you know the the Japanese tsunami. We have those same stories for hurricanes in, in the Caribbean, for example, um, and so we have those warnings, and so it's it's a it's a matter of simply how we communicated, and now in the in the world of entertainment, um, it can sometimes be reduced to another art form where really it's it it's a way of life. Yeah. Um, storytelling. So it's interesting. Um, but Carol Lee said something that goes right into the next question, which is about how we interact with storytelling. Um, so storytelling is an art delivered in an active relationship. The storyteller is in conversation with the audience. Um, how has a pandemic and virtual storytelling shifted or expanded your personal relationship um, with the art form. I'm gonna ask Sarah. Um, it's been huge, but I wouldn't say it's all been negative, uh, because my experience with storytelling hasn't been strictly, you know, through switching over to a virtual medium. I've done maybe four or five virtual shows and a few outside. Um, but for me, because storytelling, because my experience in Norway, learning oral the oral arts will say, uh, was very much in context of farming and living with the people. I actually set up an urban farm year round and I've got seven hoop tunnels, a poly tunnel and two cold frames and I'm growing for the community. So for me, it's really bringing me back to where I was when I learned storytelling and I can contact my Norwegian friends and say, hey, I'm a farmer, you know? And when I was in high school, I was in an arts program and did a lot of theater and it was the ultimate insult if you were gonna become a farmer. So um, I think that's that's a really interesting evolution. Uh, the other thing is, is I've had three kids home. So I have a three-year-old, a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old. And though I do occasionally recite stories for them because all of my stories are are specifically composed in very complex rhythm and rhyme. And so I recite them. Um, but what I do now is I facilitate their storytelling. And I have mountains of puppets that my three-year-old, my 13-year-old are using to tell stories. And my 13-year-old is really interested in Dungeons and Dragons. And most of his writing this year has been related to Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm seeing my stories come through his writing. And sometimes he's conscious of it and sometimes he isn't. But I haven't actually taught my children my stories. They know some of them by hearing them, me performing, me telling them, but I don't specifically sit them down and make sure that they learn them word by word. And so I thought it was really interesting that he was integrating that into his own precious expression. Uh, so, you know, storytelling is life. That's all I can say. So I've got my hands in the dirt a lot this year. <laughs> Uh, Bashar, you, you look eager to say something. <laughs> um, I mean, this, I mean, obviously for, for uh, I started in poetry as a spoken word poet in, in communities where we gathered once a month um, and that has completely stopped, um, you know, largely stopped. And I think I had attended a few that were virtual early on and I personally felt um, they just were not the space for me in a lot of ways. And I was reflecting on that a lot. I was reflecting on the difference in when I was performing and I would not, largely I would not be able to see the audience just like now mm -hmm. and when I'm able to see the audience um, and how, rad how radically different the experience was. I wasn't, I think I was aware at some level that I was adjusting my performance in all these minor ways as the audience interacts with me 
and how much more difficult that process was in a virtual setting. Um, so I think it, it kind of brought to the fore all the little things I was doing as a storyteller in a room to kind of tell the story. Um, and, you know, all the little improvisations. And um, but it also brought me back to how, how valuable I find that. And I think um, the words active relationship are so great because um, it's almost like knowing that, but also now having in, some, in large capacity lost that relationship um, kind of strengthened my desire to go back to it as I was starting to explore uh, more literary arts and more be fiction or, or things like that before the pandemic. Now I'm like, no, I, I want to root myself back into the storytelling, but also thinking about uh, ways that the oral storytelling can be delivered online in an active relationship and reflecting and seeing so much of that happen uh, through all these different mediums, whether it's Instagram or TikTok or even um, like creative ways. You know, humans always find a way, creative ways to maintain mm -hmm. those relationships um, and thinking how we can go to that next step. Um, so it's been, for me personally, it has been a time of like, stepping back and uh, connecting with all these, with how important that relationship is for me uh, personally, but also for storytellers at large, and trying to think about, um, trying to think about ways to do that, to continue doing that, because um, I don't know when when's the next time it's going to be that we're going to go back to, uh, at least for me as a as a you know actively performing poet, um, mm -hmm. doing two to three shows a week or or a couple few few shows a month, something like that. So thinking about what it looks like, you know the next six months or a year. Yeah, I think it's um, interesting. I think that we've seen this expansion. We've also seen some communities be more impacted by the pandemic and storytelling, spoken word community being one of them because of the nature of that relationship between the storyteller and the audience. Um, I think about Jamaican storytelling, it has a call and response. Yes. And so, you know, I can't imagine going crick and waiting for a people in Zoom to say crack. I, I imagine it'd be a significant delay and it just, it probably wouldn't come together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's I, yeah. And that had, um, that made me come up with a, uh, an on the spot question for um, Sarah around how does a Norwegian storytelling moment start on the farm? How do we know we're about to tell a story? Oh, here? Well, here or nowhere? Oh, okay. Or, or I can tell you a little of my history and how that's evolved. Um, okay. Because I was, uh, oh, 25 years ago when I first went to Norway. Actually, I had a huge scholarship for university and I realized I was getting really uh, caught up in being an overachiever. And I, and I was studying oral literature in, in, at Trent University, and I didn't understand it. And it really, it, it was really upsetting for me. And I wanted to actually understand it. And so I dropped out of university and I went and I uh, lived in Scotland, lived in Norway. I lived with the Sami people, lived with the Inuit. Um, and I, I stopped reading entirely for a few years and, and just just um, the essentials, I would read the essentials. And so I entirely immersed myself in folk music and composing orally. I, I did hear folk tale as well, uh, but they were a lot of stories I didn't really specifically wanna tell. What I was more interested in were the little tidbits of the more ancient folk tale, the pre-Christian folk tale that really spoke to me that I've then uh, researched further and then built up into these performance pieces that I have with interactive puppetry, et cetera. So for me, it was very much working on the farms and learning a very intricate folk music and then translating that into creating intricate storytelling that was also very accessible. So a Hardanger fiddle tune, it's an eight string fiddle, um, has parts that repeat, but only slightly. And you have to listen very carefully to notice that. So I think it was the complexity of it that um, drew me to creating very orally complex pieces that required memory 
and communication. And then when I got ill with um, Lyme disease, I couldn't use my arms on and off for about seven years. And so I created these, these complex stories orally in, in my head, walking around, talking to myself. Um, so that's kind of my history with storytelling. And then as an educator now sharing that through interactive puppetry performance, um, it's not interactive online, obviously, um, that, that has meant that I need to essentially step back and do something else during the pandemic and really focus on my family and my direct neighborhood, feed my neighborhood, uh, grow beautiful leafy greens and not express myself through words so much. And um, so I think because I need an audience, I can't really do it properly online. And so if I'm asked to do it, I will, but I am essentially, I'm diversifying and, um, and I love it. I, I'm an urban farmer and I love it. So, yeah. I, when you said orally complex memory and communication, and then you talked mm -hmm. about not reading, um, I hear almost a process of, of reclamation and, yes. and reconnection. Uh, and, yes. and I think it, um, it leads into the next question very nicely, um, which is, you know, storytelling for Indigenous and African diaspora identities has been impacted by the violence of colonization, genocide, and slavery. This has erased peoples, their languages, and their stories. Um, what do you think is the modern storyteller's role in decolonization and reconciliation? Um, and we see that coming up, you know, a lot um, right now is, you know, we We've learned um, of the Métis people, for example, um, who spoke Michif, which there, we can't, we have not been able to, there's like, I think less than 30 people who still speak um, that language. And I don't think any of them even live in Ontario. And so there's a lot of, um, when we talk about these ancient traditions, we often dismiss the stolen parts, the lost parts, the, um, you know, as, as Carol laid out very, these stories um, hold the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world exists in stories. And so here are these communities who've lost uh, wisdom. We can't get that wisdom back because it has been lost. But how can we um, almost use our reach as storytellers um, to bring those stories of erasure and value to the back to the forefront um, of the experience. I'm gonna take a breath. And then whoever wants to start can start. I am a white colonist type person. I, I don't have the experience of, I am an immigrant to Canada, but I don't have the experience of having for me um, so I don't I can't identify directly with that but I I don't think that all the stories have been lost and that's the oral storytelling is that even when for instance enslaved people not allowed to be educated they could still pass on a great deal through their oral story and stories have been lost. And to find the elders who know things that younger people don't know is, is one of the ways to, to reignite that. But I think that the loss is very real and that is something that needs to be acknowledged by everyone because without that acknowledgement, without you know, grasping that fact, there will be no recovery. I think that that the people who have been the the, the cultures who have have had a de deliberate erasure of their cultures. Those are the the ones who who have the, you know the greatest impact and the the greatest loss and the greatest work to do to recover 
what they can. And as you say to Neil, if it's lost, it's lost. But there are some places where things can be found or can be recreated yeah. through intention. Mm -hmm. Precisely. But I think as a, you know, as a white woman, that's, that's enough for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think often when I think of the word um, decolonization, uh, I think about it has always to go back to the land uh, because that's what where colonization started. And um, so there isn't really a process of decolonization without um, decolonizing the land and the use of the land. Um, and in that, within that process itself, there is, um, I think, lies the kind of the recovery or, or the evolving of those of those um, of those lost stories or, or whatever remains of them. But I think also, to me, for me, for example, having been in, in, the, in the spoken word scene, I essentially I came into um, a scene that was created by uh, largely by Black and Indigenous um, artists on Jordan Island. And I think a big part for me, a learning process for me is, is acknowledging that as an artist and but then also elevating the voices of those artists that, um, that are the descendants of people who started this tradition on Turtle Island. Uh, but then also turning back to my own traditions um, and I think often of like Syrian folk tales. And I've, actually part of the time I spent on the pandemic is learning uh, traditional uh, traditional Syrian oral poetry um, and then integrate that into into my own practice. So I find that at least for me, decolonizing my own, uh, both as a settler on Turtle Island and what that means and as part of a spoken word movement, which has largely been uh, created by um, Black and Indigenous artists, and then as someone who comes from a place that has been colonized and uh, continues to be colonized today, um, I think about integrating those folk tales into my into my practice, and I find that I, I think both like the elevation of artists here and integrating my own traditions into my art are, is is kind of what I see my role currently in that. Uh, but I think I always bring it back to if decolonization doesn't involve decolonizing the land and that's and like political movements such as land back and Black Lives Matter, I think it isn't really, uh, it, we risk decolonization becoming um, a buzzword like diversity and, um, and inclusion. Right. Yeah. If you don't go to the land. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add a little bit to that. Um, I can only speak for my own experience, and that's a lot of why I do this. Um, also, as an educator, I am a supply teacher, and I do arts education. And as a storyteller who has also lived in other cultures that weren't my heritage, such as with the Sami people and various Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities, I only tell the stories essentially from my heritage, and I've been doing that for over 20 years. Um, and a lot of that is, is current experience of actually learning the music, et cetera. So it's not just folktale. I only started telling folktale fairly recently. Um, but for me, what's really important is to model that one can claim their heritage in their own way. And that we as, you know, those of us with European heritage, for example, there is also colonization in our in our histories. And so my own grandmother couldn't speak Norwegian, you know, without being chastised. And it was, it was very much like I was turning on the volume of this, this genetic memory. And it was my grandmother, I'm turning up the volume for her. And so going back and learning some of these folk tales and piecing it together from what I've heard from, from my own contemporary experience and from, from what I've researched um, is very much acknowledging that there was also suppression in my heritage and to just develop some sort of empathy across the board that way, but not to, to tell anybody else's story. 
So that's where that's why I'm very much focused on the Norwegian because that's what I can own. Um, but uh, but you know I've also always used in my stories when I started creating puppets I was using characters with a variety of skin tones and some people would challenge me on that they said it's not culturally correct it's not historically correct and I said well it is to the kids who I'm telling these stories with it's relevant to them and that's all that matters they need to see themselves up here and you know so that's kind of how I step out of um, focusing on my own sort of culture and my own sort of uh, context, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think Yes, I find that, that very, that's Carol. an important. Go ahead, Carol. That an important aspect too. I, I, I tell stories from the traditions that I can claim, but I have a very mixed heritage. So that's quite a lot of different. Uh, You're a mutt. kinds of stories but I don't yeah I don't tell African stories and I don't tell I don't tell First Nations or indigenous stories from this land I have occasionally told told them in a mixed uh, set where I'm telling multicultural tales but basically I I pull from my own culture, but I, but being European, I, I can, I said, Greek, from Greek myths, and I've told, been told with other tellers, um, epic weekends where we tell, say, all of the Iliad or all of the Odyssey. Um, I feel that something that I can claim because for Europeans, that's where storytelling began in the traditions that are familiar to us. I've lost track of the question. <laughs> <What happened? laughs> it's I, called I evolution. Think that, <laughs> I think that's perfectly fine. I think that, um, I think for me, a part of the question um, in decolonization and reconciliation, and I guess I'd add reclamation, is not necessarily to tell stories of other cultural identities but to um by simply being able to to perform to partake in oral storytelling um you can create space for um groups identities that have been uh, more disenfranchised from that space uh, i think it was very um great that sarah brought up the colonization within um, European identities because we can talk about, um, how, you know, Celtic violence, Welsh violence, um, those languages. And we see that in um, in Yeats's poetry and Seamus Heaney's poetry in trying to bring those violently erased um, uh, Irish languages back. Um, you know, when we look at the history of, of English as we know it or French as we know it, there was an intentional uh, erasure of languages that were tied to particular identities that were being um, subjugated. Um, so I, I think that sometimes, I think for me, sometimes we forget the relationship between language um, and colonization mm. um, and storytelling and colonization. Even, um, I like what you said about the elders that remain. And when I think about that in the context of slavery, there was an intentional separation of people from the same tribes who spoke the same language so that they could not speak to each other, um, you know, in, in the enslaved space. And so there was this intentional act of, of separating people and language and essentially storytelling. And I think by being storytellers, we unintentionally also reclaim um, the power of voice in that. So I, you know, so that's kind of how I came to that question. Um, and my next question is for Bashar. Um, and I love that Bashar owns um, his immigrant identity so so proudly in everything that he that he does. And I just wanted to talk about that a bit more, like that relationship between story and and language um, 
and space, you know, representing the different identities and how does that, um, I know I know how it impacts me, but how does it impact you as a storyteller navigating all of that while being an immigrant and so many other things? Right, um, I think, oh, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting space to be in for me, because I think a lot of the immigrant stories we're hearing today are largely children of immigrants, uh, people who are born to immigrants. And there are there are a few voices of people who, because I immigrated to Canada at, at 17 with basically no English. And so there was uh, probably, I would say, like a five year, five to 10 year process to arrive at be, to be able to tell stories about what that means. And I remember when I first um, <clears throat> started performing, I remember that it was basically 12 years worth of stories uh, came flooding um, into poems. Uh, and I think the, uh, the interesting, I don't know if it's, I think I remember performing uh, to in, in relatively like in to a say a large group of people and then getting the, the feedback that my English is really good. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting paid to perform in English. Uh, and so I guess where that's where I was going with that is that I, I had I felt that my identity was such a big part of my presence on the stage, even if I wasn't talking about that. Um, okay. Just because of, of, uh, I guess the way I looked, but so perhaps my accent, and perhaps, and even though I was getting uh, paid to perform poetry in English, I still got the feedback that my English is really good, which isn't you wouldn't say to somebody who anybody else was performing professionally in English, um, <laughs> and so it became um, it kind of became like reflecting back. Uh, that became such a big part of of what I do because I, it's so inseparable to every story I tell. And so when I started telling stories that were not necessarily about immigrating, um, I could still see the immigrant piece uh, being such a such a critical piece in in everything I do. And that's when I started claiming it as an essential part of my identity. It just felt like wherever I go in artistic spaces. That is because of my accent, the way I look, and and certain you know my name uh, is kind of became such a central piece to who I am, even if I was trying to say something else, and uh, and then that's what the claiming it well this is then essentially inseparable. I can't really separate that from me, um, and yeah, and I think the 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 thing I think a lot about which is what I said in the beginning, was that largely stories by immigrants are by children of immigrants who are born in, in, in the place of immigration now have the space to actually tell those stories. And yeah, the, the, the distinction for me is, is having such a depth of experience, like having lived 17 years, basically becoming an adult um, in Syria and then living the second half of my life here. Um, I think uh, is is not unique necessarily, but it's rather it's less common, and there is a trying to grow into that space of of um, having known Syria so well, but now having been so integrated within what it, what Canada is, and, and integrating that into the stories. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's kind of the thoughts I have on on why it's such an integral part of my identity as an artist currently. Yeah, I wrote down what you said about my identity as a big part of my presence on stage, even if I wasn't talking about that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that is the, but I think that's a visible artist experience in a nutshell. That is a stereotyping. Yeah. And the end there was the distinction between the immigrant poet versus the first generation poet. Mm -hmm. 
for the immigrant artist versus the first generation artist. I am an immigrant artist. I, I was in Jamaica mm-hmm. for 27 years. And so I have this very distinct definition of Jamaica that would differ from a first generation Jamaican who very much aligns with the relation to the Jamaican identity that they experience in this space, which is very, very different um, from my Jamaican identity. So almost I feel we tell our stories from different points of that Jamaican of that Jamaican tree. And so I find us, um, even with all of our, our conversations, we keep circling place, geography, language, um, genetic memory, um, uh, active relationship, inactive relationship. Uh, those connections are coming um, very clear. <laughs> across all of our um, experiences um, with story. My next question is for Sarah. Um, I, I noticed, and, and you've, been, you've been commenting on it, so I think you've kind of started answering this question, but you've been commenting on the various forms that you communicate through. Um, and I, I wanted to know more about incorporating music because I, I've I've seen your performance and there's there's um, dual language. Um, there's also that subtlety uh, where I'm like, I'm not sure are these words uh, sometimes uh, are these melodies, but I know that there's something being communicated. And as someone outside of um, that space, I don't necessarily understand what's being said, but I understand what's being communicated, if that if that's right. clear. Yes. Um, so I, I wanted to know a bit more about that relationship between music and melody and storytelling as you um, have experienced it. Okay. So I'll go way back. My first experience of... Um, sort of bringing together storytelling and music was actually through rap because I led backpacking trips when I was 17 for kids from the Bronx and inner city, New York. Uh, And that's actually kind of why I do this intricate oral storytelling, um, which I find to be a type of music was from that experience. Um, So uh, in terms of incorporating language, I think that I cannot tell a Norwegian story or something based in Norwegian culture properly without actually speaking the language, without having people hear the language, because even the sound of a language is so integral. So the the language itself is music. Um, But the reason why, you know, music is so integral to what I do is because that was my that was my first experience of oral culture, essentially, of of really um, sitting down with the people in the community and spending time, a lot of time, particularly lonely people in the community, to learn this very complex music. And when I knew it, I could look them in the eye. And, you know, there was a woman who I learned a lot of songs from, and she had a stroke. And then when I returned, she could still continue to teach me those songs because I had learned the foundation. And so for me, music and story, you know, there are stories conveyed through music um, and music and story for me were integral. So when I started storytelling, it was actually as a means of sharing the music. I couldn't just go up on stage and I performed around North America, particularly in the Norwegian community, to share some of this very complex music because a lot of what they had heard, and you're talking about, you know, children and grandchildren of immigrants, a lot of what they heard was a very simplified Germanic influence on Norway rather than the older suppressed music, which was considered to be sinful. So I was bringing that music around North America and storytelling for me was was the only way to really share that music properly and in context um, and vice versa. So I don't know if that answers your question properly, uh, but, um, and now, you know, my more recent performances are all with my my husband and my family, and we do a lot based on ecology. We have one about what different kinds of poop you can find in the bush and what it can teach you. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of that is through music as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's still story, it's still narrative. 
I wanted to, I like what you said, when I knew it, I could look them in the eye. Yeah. And there's something very um, honoring the elders in, in, in that. Yes. And um, that recognition of oral culture in your experience in the Bronx and then, and then finding your own oral culture and then and bringing that forth back to um, the generations of Anori region children and grandchildren that would have been separated. And this was very clear, distinct um, points that you've made around context and, and place. And again, um, location, they just keep coming back. And I want to bring Bashar and Caroline on this question because Bashar, I know that you sing sometimes at the beginning and I don't know if it's like, is it traditional Syrian storytelling or um, but I, I've seen a couple, and I, I wanted to ask you about that, and I just remembered. That I sing? I think I sing poorly at a couple <laughs> traditional, well, traditionally, I don't know if traditional, but they're classic Arabic songs um, that are largely based in tradition, but they are fairly new. Mm. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yes. It's interesting. And then, Carol... Lean in your because you have a vast, a wide breadth of of understanding of of storytelling, um, and is there any particular culture that you have encountered um, where the music in that storytelling has been particularly striking for you? I would have to say not really for me. I occasionally do use music with my storytelling, but it's usually. Oh, this song fits nicely with this story. Not that it is integral, or that it. Um, I mean, they enhance one another sometimes, but I don't. I don't use music very much. Like Bashar, I don't feel like I'm that good a singer, so you know, I don't. I don't feature it as um, part of the storytelling. You know, I just have to correct something I said earlier. I said I tell from from the the cultural traditions that I have claimed to, but that's not entirely true. It is true that I that those are the stories I tell. But I have to that I have been given by people from other cultures who say, "Here, you may tell this story yeah. that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually from my culture." Um, I yeah. tell a couple of stories from India that um, you know were were given to me and I, you know, learned a bit of Urdu to, to, to say the phrases to, to bring it together. But they're, well, uh, that's enough to, about that. It's not on topic, but I, I just wanted to correct that because I realized I, I told a lie and you know what? <laughs> that's what storytelling is, right? People say, oh, you're telling a <laughs> story. I mean, you're lying. <laughs> Um, well, there is a sharing of, of story and sharing of, of community um, across identity. So um, thank you for that. But you know what, Carly, that is perfect for the next question because it's, it's a Carly question. And um, it ties into your um, travels and engage with the different culture. And, I, and I, I wanted to think about that when I go back to the responsibility of the storyteller and, and what role does the storyteller have in the new world that we're trying to create is what have these experiences taught you um, about storytelling as a unifying art? Um, as you think about the future that we're we're actively in the middle of a, a, a fight for, I think we'll always be in the middle of a fight for something, but what have you learned about storytelling as a unifying art through all your travels and teaching and cultural interactions? Wonderful question, thank you. Um, what I have learned most, of course, is from other storytellers telling their stories. And I remember particularly at a storytelling festival in Australia, where we were told over the course of half a day a creation story by an Aboriginal teller who felt he could tell this to storytellers because they knew how to listen for half a day, which most people don't know how to do anymore. <laughs> and 
it was in that telling that I came to understand issues here in this country because I didn't get it about the land. White European people, the colonists talk about land and ownership and this is ours or we got it from you or we didn't, we stole it or whatever. And that is Aboriginal is relationship to the land. It is not, this land is ours, but we belong to the land. The land does not belong to us. And that's, you know, Europeans are into ownership and possession and this is mine and not yours. And it's, it's, a, it's a really odd, I, I don't know how we got that way, I guess because Europe's small and there are a lot of people of a lot of different cultures. But in Canada or in Australia or a lot of other places in the world, the whole question of the land is not a thing of ownership, it's of belonging. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I found that transformational for me. It made me understand all the questions here in Canada quite differently than I had before. But I learned it in Australia from an Aboriginal teller there. Yeah. I have yeah, I learn, I learn from the people I, I teach. That's true, too. Um, mm -hmm. It's that's what's great about stories is that you just keep learning more stuff. When I was first trained as a storyteller, I, it was in a multicultural group. And three of the tellers started telling a wonderful set called The Truth About Indians. And the three tellers were a Mohawk woman and an Indian man from dad and a woman from India. And they were all Indians. So they told this about what it is to be an Indian of the Indian variety that they, that each was. And I just can't tell you how wonderful that was. Two of those people are no longer living and I'm really sorry that they aren't because, because they were wonderful tellers and I learned so much from them. But it is the learning from the other tellers. But you learn from your audience too. While you're telling, you learn from your audience. Jan Andrews, who is also no longer living but was a member of the Order of Canada for her storytelling and her writing. A great elder in, in storytelling in Canada. Her way of describing storytelling is that the story happens in the space between, the space between the teller and the listener. The listener is creating half the story. The storyteller has the words and some of the understanding, but so much of the story is in how it's received and who it is receiving it. And like you, Sarah, with all your different uh, puppets representing the faces that you're telling to, you know, every princess can be a princess. I don't tell princess stories, but you know, Me neither. <laughs> as an example, if you're telling to a group of little children, every little girl and every little boy, whatever their face may be, can be the princess or the prince. And again, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter what their cultural background might be. They can put themselves into and identify with the characters in a story from a completely different culture and enjoy being that or enjoy those adventures without um, without anybody saying, yeah, but um, wasn't that color or you, know, you just don't have to have that the, the pictures are the pictures are made by the by the which is why oral storytelling is so different from written literature if you look at a folk tale that's been written you can tell whether it was written from an oral version or written from a literary point of view just by the 
because so much is left to your listener for your telling. And I, I will be true for almost any storyteller, except for, except for in the case of, of completely literary stories that are being told you with permission. Did I answer I the question? To... The question only appears really briefly <laughs> on the screen. Uh, you did answer the question, and I, I know that Sarah has something to add to that. Oh, to I just very quickly wanted to, to add to that, Carolee, that um, when I was learning folk music, one thing that really spoke to me was that in Norwegian, it's the same word to learn and to teach. It's only, ident it's only differentiated in context. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's wonderful to know. Thank you for that. What a gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that exists in, in, in um, for several languages like that, where these very separate power structure concepts um, in our society are, don't exist in uh, pre-colonized um, society. So I think that's um, interesting. My final question goes to education. Um, which some educators would find interesting because I, I am vehemently against read-alouds and um, dictation sessions. I, I don't think that, I think their rooted purpose is, is not a good one. But I, I agree. I, I, I do believe that oral storytelling um, mm. is something that should be in our schools and, and, and learning environments. And I think it is very different from uh, I read aloud is why I made that distinction because I can already hear educators go, but we do read alouds, and they're not they're they're not the same thing. Uh, uh -huh. So, uh, and anyone can can jump in, but I wanted for our, like our closing question to think about, you know, oral storytelling in in a classroom. You know, how could what, especially as we have these diverse. Um, various um, representations um, in our classrooms. Um, how, you know, do you think that we should have oral storytelling? What could that do for building cross-cultural, um, cross-gender, cross so many things relationships in a, in a learning space? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I dedicated- Story, oh, sorry. Are we out of time? Oh, I, I dedicated 10 years basically to uh, bringing oral literacy into the classroom. So that has been a big focus of mine. And, you know, the puppets, I started doing puppetry when I was uh, creating stop motion films with students, and then they created puppets for those films. Uh, so, so a lot of what I do as a performer now started with the students. I learned felting alongside the students. They helped teach me how to felt and now I'm a felting artist. So I think one thing that I really struggled with was differentiating, as you put your finger on, Tanil, between um, oral communication and speaking out loud to oral narrative or uh, oral expression. And that it didn't have to have a written literary component, but it could. And so often there were students who um, I assessed and they received a level four, they received the highest level and they had never received that level before. And the teachers would challenge me and have saying, yeah, this is different. Just because they always got a level two, maybe it's because they actually have their ears open more and they are not thriving in reading and writing that they actually excelled in this area, that they excelled in oral literacy. And so mm -hmm. I feel very firmly that it's underrepresented and that it's represented improperly and incorrectly because that it, we don't receive training for that in teacher's ed. Um, and there was a very, there's a, there was a cultural hierarchy when I was learning in education and memory is on the lowest rung of the Bloom's taxonomy. And I think that is, that is inherently wrong and it sets us up for uh, cultural discrimination. And it's got, even when my son did uh, enrichment last year, he quit because they were learning the booms tech taxonomy. And he said, my mom's a storyteller, I'm out of here. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that there needs to be more education, more training, 
um, that it is not necessarily just an extension of written literacy. It well, can I agree be, completely. but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I wish every teacher was required to read Dr. Johanna Kaivenhoven's book, In the Presence of Each Other. She spent a whole year in a classroom in BC, I think it was in Victoria anyway, it was with uh, Linda Stedman, a, a teacher and a storyteller, and she identified all kinds of storytelling, but this teacher definitely made a point of oral storytelling. She would have a storytelling time, and I know that anyone who is a storyteller has experienced this thing of, you know, there's the squirmer and there's the hyperactive child and there's so on and everybody can sit still for a story. I had a hyperactive child that he had ADHD and he sat still for a story completely. It's the storytelling goes into a different part of the brain than reading or being read to or a lot of other things. It, it reaches the same part of the brain that hypnosis reaches. And so when people say they were just like they were in a trance, it's true, they were. And this was experienced, the, the, the book I'm referring to, In the Presence of Each Other, that's the whole point. It's in the presence of each other. It's not something that you do by yourself. Storytelling is an interactive art and it doesn't exist unless it is. And there, it's true that you can listen to a CD or a, you know, whatever, or just listen to a story on the radio. But in fact, you're still interacting if you're listening because you still are creating the images. You still are That's making right. the identification of the character. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm not a teacher, but I think as a performer, whenever there has been many times where I performed and, um, people would come up to me and they would say, I didn't know poetry could be like this. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my response when I first started writing. I went to a show and I was like, I didn't know poetry could be like this. And I always wonder, well, why didn't I know? And uh, there has been such a big disconnect between specifically for poetry, but I think many art forms um, that are based on the word is between, between the education system and what it can actually deliver and uh, I think the fact that there are people, who adults, asking those questions indicates that we need to bring this kind of, we need to bring something that engages the students into the room, the way storytelling or spoken word is engaging them to, to uh, and then help them realize that it's possible to tell stories in such a large number of ways, not these specific ways being taught. Mm -hmm. And to make them laugh. That's a big thing for me in education. Huge. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Education actually should be fun. One hundred percent. Thank you so much. I, th I, you know, if Word on the Street could just give me that last five minutes, I could take it to work for my next meeting when I advocate. It's like, see, it's empty there. I, there are three people who agree with me. Um, so, but thank you, and Maya. Take it away. Yeah, thank you all very, very much for your insights this afternoon and your thoughtful conversation about the tradition of oral storytelling. It's been truly a joy to listen to and learn from you all. So thank you. And thank you to everyone tuning in from home. Uh, if you're interested in picking up any books talked about during the festival, you can check out our virtual bookstore and our official ebook seller, Rakuten Kobo. You have until the final day of the festival to sign for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. You can visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival you tune in, we'll announce one bonus entry code. And today's bonus entry code is Alliance. Make sure to tune in later today uh, to our panel, uh, an, an, another panel with the KW Writers Alliance, Writers on Reading happening at 3 p.m. and we'll feature Aaron Bow, E.K. Johnston, Mariam Pierby, Tennis McDonald, and Caroline Topperman. If you're interested in having some hands-on experience, sign up for our workshops. At 4 p.m. today, Ursula Gray and Bones McKay will be leading an interactive graphic novels workshop, also presented by KW Writers Alliance. 
Uh, and at six, we are joined by the Hello Boyfriend Comics Collective for their workshop, Shitty Comics, where you will strive to make some really bad sequential art, presented in partnership with the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street and the work we do by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.